We're so pleased to have you with us today. We're going to speak with a very interesting fellow named Malik Parekh. He has built a just a fantastic career for himself in the Asia Pacific region. He came, well, he came in a roundabout way from India to the United States, Philippines, where he really made a, a really a big impact on the nation's economic development and certainly has distinguished himself as one of the leading uh, leaders, business leaders across the Asia Pacific region. So a very interesting fellow and we'll have a very interesting session with him. Please welcome Malik Parekh. So really pleased to have you with us, Malik. I know um, you've been busy, so, so busy for a number of years now, working on your, well, I, not, not a project, but working as a CEO of mm -hmm. what used to be called SPI Global, but I know it, the, the company split mm -hmm. into um, Inspiron. Is, is that, did I say that correctly? In, yes, Inspiron. That's right. Inspiro, okay. And yeah. well, maybe Malik, could, could we start off and have you, I mean, there's uh, many people that know you, there'll be some that, that don't, but maybe if, if we could start and, and could you just tell us a, a brief history of your your professional career? Um, you know, when you get uh, uh, older and older, uh, Richard, the brief history doesn't remain brief anymore, but I'll, I'll try to be as, as, as uh, brief as possible. Uh, so just, uh, you know, taking off from uh, my adventures in the Philippines, uh, I started coming to the Philippines in 2001. And at that time, I was uh, working for uh, one of the largest uh, satellite TV companies in the U.S. called Dish Network. Uh, mm -hmm. And they hired me to set up their first international call center and asked me to uh, go to some eight different countries in my first three months with the company and uh, asked me to come back and suggest uh, and recommend which country would be the right country to set up their first international call center in. Uh, so I went to many different places and the uh, Philippines was one of them. And obviously I fell in love with the Philippines back in 2001. As soon as I came here, I met with people. I did some round tables um, and focus groups with uh, not only people working in the industry at that time, it was a very small industry, but also with uh, some of the uh, recent graduates and uh, went back to Denver, Colorado and suggested to my CEO at that time that, hey, I think we need to go and set up our call center in the Philippines. So he said, go make it happen. And that's when my partnership with the PLDT started. I uh, met with uh, MV MVP back then, as well as Rose Montenegro, as you uh, know her yes. as well. Uh, yeah. And uh, she was trying to look for the first U.S. client and I was looking for a partner who knew the Philippines as a country. Uh, and it was so a marriage made in heaven. Uh, so I did that for the next five years until 2005. I left Dish Network uh, after that and joined Teletech, which is one of the largest uh, BPO companies in the world. And uh, sure. back in Denver, it was just across the street from Dish Network. So it was not a big deal. And my goal was to actually join Teletech to help them with their US operations. But the gentleman who hired me, uh, Brian Delaney, he knew that I have been going back and forth the Philippines and I understand that market really well. So he said, Malik, would you mind uh, going there for three months and helping us out? Because we, we do need some help there. We are going through a massive ramp uh, in that country. And I said, absolutely, I love the Philippines. I'll go there for three months and I'll come back uh, to the US because my plan was to actually continue my career in the US. But sure enough, uh, the three months uh, ended up becoming, uh, what, 14 years now. I never went to Denver. Uh, three months later, they promoted me to be the general manager or the country head uh, for the Philippines. And then I stayed, uh, that's when I think uh, you and I met first time. Yes. Uh, I had a chance to meet with you and Rebecca back when I was working for Teletech. Um, and, and I stayed with them for three and a half years. We took the company from 6,000 people to some 22,000 people in three years. Um, and I thought I had done my part. I needed a break. So I went on a sabbatical for six months. Uh, and I was tracking Himalayas, uh, Richard, when um, MVP through one of the executive recruiters called me and asked me if I would join the group to run their BPO assets. And they were 
multiple assets in different parts of the company. And they wanted somebody to come in, bring it all together under one umbrella, and then uh, run it as a CEO. So um, I gave it a shot. And, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been with that group. It's been 10 years? Jeez. Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, bravo. Now, as you mentioned, we first met when you were with Teletech. And yeah, it seemed to me that, I don't know, I, I was really impressed with the work you did during that time. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, what you've done since, of course, is also. But can you describe what you did with Teletech in more detail? I remember you grew from something like 5,000 people when you came in to, was it 22,000 people over mm -hmm. an 18-month period? Yeah, it was uh, around 6,000 people when I came in. Um, Six, okay. June of 2006. Um, and I left in May of 2009. So less than three years, we grew from 6,000 to over 22,000 employees. And, you know, it was uh, an Herculean task. Um, yes. When we took that project on, uh, it seemed so insurmountable. Uh, it seemed like it was out of our reach. But at that time, uh, we invited one of the... Um, Filipinas, one of the first Filipinas to climb Mount Everest, um, Janet Bellarmino. Uh, she had just come back from Mount Everest after climbing it. And we invited her to be a keynote speaker. And when she came to speak to our leaders in Teletech, she talked about how when she was climbing Mount Everest, she never kept looking at the, at the summit because she was so um, impacted by it. You know, she felt overwhelmed. And she felt that it was so out of her reach. She thought she would never get there. So instead, she focused always on her next step because she felt that that was within her reach. And after the next step, one after the other, a few days later, she was at the top of the summit. So we applied the same logic, Richard, when we were trying to grow Teletech. Instead of thinking about getting to 25,000 people in three years, we just said, okay, we, you know, tomorrow, let's just go and go out and hire hundred more people. And then the next day you do the same thing. And before you know it, uh, you know, you start uh, getting traction, your leaders start feeling comfortable and they feel that they're gaining uh, momentum. Um, so that was one of the, you know, most amazing things that I remember about my time with Teletech that I also had an opportunity to work with some of the most talented people that I can find in the BPU industry. And, you know, since then they have spread across the industry and many of them are country leaders of uh, various organizations. And I'm so proud of what they have achieved. That's true. I have seen many of your former people and they are all well paid, which I'm so pleased to see and have yes. done fantastically well. And for years, I'm sure you know that uh, many of them met they had they formed some kind of an alumni yes. uh, teletech alumni group and they would meet and, and they would hug and cry and all this kind of stuff about yes. about that time because i just an aside here but i i met your boss your former boss years ago ken tuckman yes it was an interesting meeting and i told him at the time that this was a major you know, a time for the industry in Philippines. Cause at that time yeah. you remember having a couple thousand people in Philippines was a big deal. Yes. And then when you guys came in and grew to, you know, 6,000 to 22,000 over a year and a half, this lit the industry on fire. Cause if everybody yes. said, if Teletech did, how come we're not doing, how come they're so far ahead? Yes. Nobody had ever seen this kind of a thing. And, Anyway, he, he was appreciative to hear it. And, and also, we gave yeah. you the uh, BPO Company of the Year Award, ICT Award. Yes. I mean, it was a very special time. And I yes. really believe that Teletech and your contribution and your mm -hmm. team, of course, really mm -hmm. had a big impact. And, and that was really a, a, a spike time for, for the industry where BPO really became the, the dominant uh, employment uh, powerhouse of the, the the entire nation. So it was it was quite a, a time, and I think you should be proud, you know, mm -hmm. of, of that work you did, uh, uh, Malik. It was a very, um, you know, I still sometimes talk to people about it, and and you know, it, you know, it's a bit of I, uh, you know, tears in the, you know, it, it was really quite a big impact because before 
teletech, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it like that, I may be exaggerating a bit, but, uh, but uh, before that, the country's employment situation for Filipinos was desperate. Mm -hmm. And ever since, you know, it's become a very, uh, you know, a, a very enterprising economy where people are, are really well paid and, and there's lots of opportunity. So, okay, I'm going on a bit about that. Sure. I mentioned, um, Malik, I mentioned your former boss at, at Teletech mm -hmm. and, and the, the respect that I and many have of him. He's also known, not surprisingly, mm -hmm. as being extremely demanding. And mm -hmm. others I know have worked with him, they, you know, have stories about him. But, you know, I, I think such experiences really help build a, a person's a character. But what can you say, what advice would you say about mm -hmm. how to work with, work for a really hyper demanding uh, a, a, a boss? How did you survive during that time? Go ahead. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, look, uh, when I look back, um, having that time with Ken Tuckman, having time with uh, Charlie Ergen of Dish Network, another very bright but extremely demanding boss, uh, has been probably the most uh, important part of my learning process. I think, I don't think any formal education would have prepared me for what I ended up doing in my career over the last 10 years, then having spent time with Ken Tuckman and Charlie Ergen. So I'm actually extremely grateful uh, to those folks uh, who have uh, helped build my character, as you mentioned earlier. I think what, what I would share with people is that, uh, no, no, and, and look, I actually stayed in touch with both of them. In fact, uh, Ken Tuckman uh, endorsed my book. Uh, his quote about the book is actually is oh, part of my book. Uh, yeah. You, by the way, the book is on the way for you and Rebecca. Uh, you should be getting it on Monday, according to our UPS um, tracking system. Um, Very good. And you will see his quote, actually, in, in, in the book. So what, what I share with people is that uh, when they have a chance to meet or work with somebody as demanding, uh, somebody who is 24-7, nonstop, uh, someone who is bright and always 10 steps ahead of you, uh, don't fear these people. Don't hide from them. Don't uh, run away from those opportunities. Instead, embrace them uh, and learn as much as you can from these people. One of the things that I learned uh, from these people is that for me, it was a job at Teletech and at Dish Network. For them, it was their baby. I mean, this is what they have been doing for you know, their professional careers. Um, so they took a lot of pride in what was happening with the company. For them, it was not just a job. It was also a passion. They were, Ken Tuckman is a passionate man about customer service. He can talk your ears off if you give him a chance. Uh, and he will tell you everything he wants to tell you about where the industry is going, where it has been, and what are some of the things that companies need to do. Same thing with Charlie Ergen. He's passionate about satellite TV and now wireless. Um, so one thing you learn about these people is that um, you can be passionate about something that you're doing. And then when you are passionate about what you're doing, there is no difference between weekdays and weekend. The reason why these people yeah. have no problem sending you an email or a text message or call you in the middle of night, even on a weekend, is because for you, it's weekdays and weekend. For them, it is not. For them, it's passion. It's not work. Uh, they don't designate, okay, thank God it's Friday and now I'm not going to work anymore. It's like a nonstop 24-7, 365 day process. So that's one thing we can learn that, you know, find something that you're passionate about and then work stops being work. That's number one. Uh, there's something else that uh, I would suggest people to do is when you're working with these people, learn how to cultivate that holistic view of the business. Uh, one of my best learning experiences was uh, meeting with Charlie Ergen on our monthly Saturday meeting. Uh, every last Saturday of the month, he would invite uh, executives from around the country to come together. And then for eight hours, he would grill every one of them about what they are working on. And one by one, executives would have to go in front of him and explain what they are doing. And then, you know, basically receive a barrage of questions. But having gone through that 12 times during my time at Dish Network, Richard, I learned how to cultivate 
a holistic view of the business so that you can look at your business from a variety of perspectives versus just one perspective. So um, never run away from an opportunity when you will have a chance to work with an extremely demanding but passionate entrepreneur because you can learn so much from them. Absolutely. And just for those listening who don't know, but Ken Tuckman, he's a billionaire, I believe. Is he not, uh, Malik? Oh yeah, he's uh, a little, you know, a lot more than a billion uh, worth. Is he, even, yes, you know, yes, he's the he owns the majority of the company. Sure, and and there's only what 150 billionaires in the world, give or take. So yeah. it's quite a good thing. And he started the business from a trailer, I understand, and and so it's quite a story. And so yeah, 24 hours a day, and this is what you were working too, right? 24 hours yeah, a day. Yeah, we had we had no choice, and um, yeah, there's. And I remember getting calls in the middle of the night from Ken, and he expects you to answer those calls, uh, no matter what time he calls you. Uh, and, and you know, you kind of learn. Uh, if, if you just think it from your perspective, you resent it. But if you understand, and if you start drinking the same cool that he's drinking, uh, then you can actually start feeling some energy flowing through you to your team. And then before you know it, you have a magic uh, happening at your workplace. Sure. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite a story and quite a guy. He's known as kind of a Steve Jobs type, very intense. Yes. And, and you're, I mean, there's no such thing as quality time in the, well, his quality time or these kinds of people quality time is 24 hours a day and they're married to their business. That is their, you know, their first marriage. They also might have a wife, but that's, that's yeah. secondary, you know, and that's what you got to do when, when you're building an organization and there's no, reason to uh hide from that or or apologize for it yes. that's the fact and so quite an opportunity for you yes. now one thing malik that you also became known as and you mentioned or we, we talked a bit about the people that you hired and developed during that time have then went on to you know have fantastic careers in other organizations what is involved with building, you know, a real high performing organization like that. What, what did you hire for and uh, motivate? What can you tell us about that, Malik? Sure. So, you know, I always believe that um, it's better to look for the attitude versus the right aptitude when you're looking for people, because uh, you can, teach someone aptitude by investing in their learning, by putting them through more training. Uh, one thing you cannot teach someone is to have the right attitude. Once they have set their mind on how to live their life, it's very hard to change, you know? Uh, and as we get older, it becomes harder and harder for us to change the basic ways how we look at life. So I always believe that um, it's important to hire for the right attitude versus the right aptitude. Um, and that's what we did at Teletech. Uh, I inherited a, a great team of people when I came here, but then we also went out and hired quite a few other people. And we looked for the people who would have the right attitude, who will fit into the culture that we were trying to build. And the, our culture, if you remember, uh, Richard, was based on two keywords, uh, both M, uh, malasakit, uh, which means genuine compassion and care for others, uh, not only your coworkers, but also your clients, um, you know, your investors, all the key stakeholders. We must have enough malasakit, enough compassion for them. So we do our best. And the second word uh, that we really got married to at Teletech was also meritocracy. Uh, and what that means is no place for unnecessary office politics. Uh, people don't have to go to work wondering who's gonna backstep them. Uh, they don't have to worry about whether I'm playing golf with my boss uh, or do i need to have a drink with him every weekend uh, so that i right. i'm in good graces with that person uh, the only thing that mattered at that time was were you doing your job were you performing were you creating uh, amazing results out of your business unit and if you did that then obviously we made sure that those people continued to grow in the company and went to places so uh, most important thing is obviously hiring the right people and then creating the right culture that allows them to work together, that allows them to 
perform as a team and achieve great results. So those are the two things that I would uh, mention about that experience. Okay. Now, Malik, hiring for attitude, sometimes it's hard to, you know, I spoke with someone uh, last week and, and she was saying that, you know, hiring for character, she, she wants people with good character. But these kinds of things are hard or are easy to fake, aren't they? And, mm -hmm. and difficult to uh, assess when you're interviewing or hiring people. How do you find these people? Is it, you know, hire and fire or, or how, how do you do that? Luckily, you know, um, I didn't have to do a lot of hiring, firing. Um, but, you know, I typically don't do the traditional HR interview. So by the time somebody comes to me for a final interview, I'm not given a set of questions that I need to ask the person. I don't, I'm not given, uh, you know, a set of um, case studies that I need to ask them for. Typically, my questions are very free flowing, like this uh, conversation that we are having, Richard, okay. uh, where you ask random questions, questions that the person is not expecting. Uh, you can fake something when you are expecting certain questions, but uh, if you're not expecting some questions about, you know, what have you gone through in your life, uh, experiences completely out of the blue, then you catch them in their, uh, you know, inherent. Um, mindset that they have created so far and then it's also chemistry you know you you get a sense whether you have a chemistry with somebody or not whether uh, you know they see they look at the world the same way that you do and uh, you also have to you know you probably are equally adapt at this uh, Richard but after having dealt with thousands of people you intuitively start capturing even, you know, some of the smallest nonverbal cues coming from that person. So they may be saying one thing, but I'm looking for their body language and see uh, if their body language matches or not. And so you don't, you don't turn into like an FBI who is able to, you know, do the body language and to see whether somebody's lying or not, but you have enough experience in you to say, okay, you know, what? I think, everything gels with this person what he's saying his behavior his thoughts are all aligned and if that is this then obviously you're making the right choice okay well we should say for people watching who maybe make mistakes with their hires please understand that it is a it's a you know it's not a hundred percent you know thing. yes i know i yes. calculated that I think I interviewed, because I was in recruiting years ago, as you know, and I recruited people around the world. And I calculated I'd interviewed something like 20,000 people in my career. And I thought, gee, why do I still make mistakes after all this time? But so for people watching, you know, Malik has had great success hiring fantastic people, but you know, it takes time and, and you know, unavoidable mistakes are, are made. So don't be too hard on yourself with that. Um, now, Malik, what do you think about um, things that hold people back in their careers? Let's say you, you hire people who you feel strongly are good people, dedicated and so forth, but yet there's things that they destroy about their own careers. And, and it's heartbreaking to see that. Everybody has seen, everybody who hires people has seen this happen. What do you think? What, what are the things that drive you crazy about good people who you know, hold themselves back? Well, quite, I mean, a few things that come to my mind. Uh, one is um, when someone loses their passion for learning, mm -hmm. um, when uh, they feel like they have arrived in their life. So, you know, if they never imagined that they could even be a manager in a company, uh, they never imagined if they could be a director in their company. As soon as they become a manager and a director, if they stop learning, if they think, and if they start sending the messages to themselves and to the people around them that they have arrived, you know, this is it. They're at the top of their game. Uh, there's nothing more to learn. Uh, I see so many times very talented people digging a big hole for themselves or stalling their career, not because they're not working hard. It's just they have stopped learning new things. So um, hmm. one thing I would always share with people, and I, every time I'm talking to the leaders, 
um, in leadership summits or in webinars that never stop learning. Uh, every time you look at any successful person, you know, look at Bill Gates, he reads one book a, a week, even at that age. He's the one of the richest men in the world. Um, you know, he has retired from Microsoft practically, and yet his passion for learning is so incredible and it's so inspiring. Warren Buffett, another uh, yep. gentleman in his 80s, one of the richest men in the world, but he's still nonstop learning new things uh, and willing to uh, go beyond their comfort zone, right? So that's, that's very important, I think. That's one thing I would always suggest to people that they keep doing to make sure that their career doesn't stall. Something else um, that uh, I see sometimes people doing that can be negative to, for their career is they are afraid to stick their neck out. Uh, they're afraid to take chances. They're afraid to try new things at the workplace. And look at Richard, what's happening in the world. I mean, the likes of Amazons, the likes of Google are doing amazing things, even in the pandemic. I mean, the top five technology firms in the world took in 18% more revenue in Q3 of this year amidst the pandemic. And yeah. look at what happened to JC Penney's and J. Cruz or the Lord and Taylor or the Brooks Brothers of the world. They all filed for bankruptcy. So companies who are trying new things, companies who are allowing their employees to try new things are continually succeeding in their process. Whereas the companies who are married to their past and have stopped trying new things are suffering. So people who want to have an amazing career going forward, they would need to be the catalyst for change. So when I see people becoming extremely complacent, then I have a feeling that, okay, I think that person is, uh, you know, artificially putting a ceiling to where they can go in their life. Yeah. Okay. That's very good, extremely good. Now, yeah. what do you think? Some a lot of people or a lot of businesses are always asked, well, what is your unique selling proposition mm -hmm. as a business? It's kind of a standard thing in you know for organizations when they're in selling mode. But I've also heard the same thing is required for leaders. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you yourself has what, what would be called unique about you as opposed to other leaders? Well, I mean, I, I see uh, it's, it's a tough question to answer. It I don't tough. obviously, you know, speak about myself all the time, but what I see is that there are common elements with successful leaders. Uh, and I try to emulate them. Um, I would say. So I, I like what Bill Gates does. You know, he started Microsoft and then he ended up predicting this uh, COVID-19 crisis four yep. years ago in a TED talk. I yep. mean, think about a brilliance of this man uh, that he didn't just stay focused on computers and the software. He has branched out to so many different things. So I, I try to emulate the likes of Bill Gates and try to commit to learning new things. And if you remember during the last event that we did together, Aim High, I talked about uh, learning how to swim uh, at the age of 42. I went to one of the swimming classes here in the Philippines. <laughs> and when I arrived, I was the oldest man, obviously, or the rest of the people were between ages of seven and 11. Uh, and uh, it took me the longest to learn how to swim. I, I had to take the same class twice to finally figure out how to do the freestyling. Uh, because I was afraid of uh, deep water, I actually just two years ago uh, signed up for scuba diving. And I have an yeah. certification for not only the beginners, but also the advanced uh, scuba diving certificate. So wow. I, I try to learn from these people and say, what? what is my fear? You know, what are some of the things that I'm afraid of? What are some of the things that I'm uncomfortable doing? And I keep doing those things, even if they have nothing to do with my business at Inspiro or SPI Global before, uh, because I was training my mind to keep doing things that I was afraid of, when the situations arose at the workplace, 
where I had to make tough decisions, when I had to do something that I had not, never done before, I had enough mental uh, muscles to go with it and not be afraid of it. So if, if you were to ask people around me, they would say the same thing that, you know, there is one thing that uh, Maulik kind of does it effortless is he keeps on pushing his comfort zone and he keeps on pushing our comfort zones as well. Uh, that's, a, it, that's an important skill to have as a leader. It is. Okay. That's very interesting. Okay. And now, Malik, you know, I don't know if we've talked about this before. I don't think so, but something on in my mind a lot. Now you have, I don't know, to others, it seems natural how your career has progressed and it's, you know, been a great story, all this kind of stuff. Not everybody has the same career, as you know. Is there something in you or in people who achieve like that or is it something that is that, that you grew up with you know your father and mother pushed it into you you know the the nature versus nurture nurture argument mm -hmm. what do you think about that you've had a lot of people working for you and, and, and have watched their careers also is it more nature meaning something that's within you almost genetic or is it nurture something that your environment and parents and family and so forth push in into you? Well, what do you think about that? I think uh, it's both. Um, you know, obviously, uh, okay. you need to have the right nurturing environment when you're growing up. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to have a family that uh, promoted uh, the importance of education in my life. Um, I saw my parents working very hard. My father uh, was a successful executive in an insurance company in India. Uh, he was a self-taught man. When uh, my father was on in the eighth grade, uh, 14 years old, he lost his father and essentially had to, you know, See. become a, a person with a lot of motivation to um, learn new skills and he learned English on his own. Um, he found a job and slowly grew through the ranks uh, to become a regional executive um, managing, you know, over a hundred people. That was unheard of in his family. Uh, I saw my mother becoming the first person in my family to get the master's in our national language Hindi. Uh, I saw her working as a teacher and working very hard. So, they didn't tell me that, hey, you must work hard, you must do this, you must do this. They just showed me that if you want to be successful in life, you have to put in your effort, you have to put in your time, uh, and you have to be a self-learner. Nobody's going to teach you after you're done with your school what you need to keep learning. So that's the nurture part of it, that I was surrounded by good role models in my life. And then the other thing is um, I was naturally interested in doing my best in everything I did. I never imagined, and people have asked me, Richard, did you always want to become a CEO? No, I never thought that actually I would become a CEO. I aspired to think like a CEO or I aspired to be like a CEO, but I never thought that I would end up becoming a CEO. Uh, but one thing I knew was that if I was given an opportunity, I was gonna give my 200%. Um, and I was looking for those opportunities always. So even when I joined Teletech, for example, when the gentleman who hired me asked me, if you're open to getting out of your comfort zone and actually moving to the Philippines for three months, um, would you do that? Some people may say, you know what? No, I'm happy in the US. I have a good life. Uh, I have a good friend circle. I have a good social life. Why would I stop that? And why would I move to the Philippines? But I said, yeah, sign me up. So being open to those doors when people open them for you is also an important part of your journey so i think it needs to be both uh, there is a little bit of a genetics i'm sure is part of uh, why some people succeed and some others don't but there is also a part of the environment that people grow up in okay yeah it's an interesting concept because often I, I see people who are from bad nurtured environments mm. and do very well. Yeah. Often other times I see people come in what look like ideal nurturing environments and they are really not, uh, they don't turn out well. So yeah. 
Uh, no, I agree with you. I mean, Steve Jobs, uh, he was... Uh, Steve Jobs, yeah. He lived in foster homes uh, and yep. then obviously stayed with a family that adopted him. But you can tell, like, where is his drive coming from, right? Uh, that's yes. a good point. So it's hard to hard to tell. Uh, luckily for me, it appears that, um, you know, I was given a good environment to grow up in. And that, I think, played a role in just being calm and kind of grounded in my approach to life. Absolutely. You had both yeah. the barrels of the gun going for you. So, okay. Now, Malik, a lot of people see you and I, we've had you speak in front of hundreds and uh, thousands of, of people. Uh, and you come across as a very extroverted uh, a person. And many people think that CEOs have to be extroverted and, and uh, because that's, how would you describe yourself, extroverted or, or introverted? I'm a certified introvert. Um, okay. And people have a hard time believing it because uh, to your point, they see me speaking in front of hundreds of people. They, uh, at my companies in Spiro and SPI Global before, they saw me walking the hallways and you know doing high fives with employees and connecting with them, having a small chat with them, getting to know their family background and their, uh, how they're doing. So they think that I'm naturally an extroverted person, but that's an effort for me. Um, given a choice between being in a social setting or being in a solitude, I instinctively prefer being in solitude. I love my own time sitting on a couch with a nice book or writing in my journal about you know what's the next thing I want to do. That's what I feel like I'm the most creative. Uh, being with people, it's an effort, uh, and I spend a lot of energy doing it. But what I've learned is that uh, because I'm certified introvert, and in my job as a CEO in the past, I had no choice but to connect with people. What I learned is that when I spend time with people, I must make it count. So when I do get in front of my leaders at uh, Inspiro, that one hour, I must make it count and I, I want to make it as inspirational as possible. So that energy will remain with them for a very long time. Because if you ask people at Inspiro or SPI Global, they'll tell you they didn't see Malik all the time. They didn't see Malik in front of them, giving them lectures every day. But once a year when I did that, that I, I really thought about what I want to say to them. And I made sure that uh, I made it worth my while. If they saw me walking the hallways once a month, I made sure that I didn't just walk through people, didn't look at them, didn't connect with them eye to eye, didn't go and say hi, you know, hello, didn't do high five. If I did any of that, then they say, okay, he's just a snob or, you know, he's an introvert. But when I was with them for that half hour on the hallways, I made sure that I was there physically, mentally, spiritually. They got all of me during that time. So then after that half an hour, I had to go back in my office and recharge my batteries because uh, that's, yeah. I, I needed to figure out, okay, how do I recharge the batteries so I have a, enough energy for me to do that again a month later? Absolutely. And I, I'm surprised how many senior people really are, you know, they have similar type of stories as being introverts. And just yeah. for people watching, you told me some years ago about a, a TED talk uh, mm -hmm. where a guy talked about being an introvert and, you know, you don't have to hide from the world, although mm -hmm. we all like to, I'm an introvert too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it is, a, there, there's a very senior people who I would say more often become top in, in their careers as opposed to extroverted people, nothing against either one, of course, yes. it takes a mix of people, but mm -hmm. people watching who are introverted and who have trouble with people, please understand that, you know, you can be a, a Malik too, or, or these other uh, uh, many people who, who have done very well. Um, so, I, and I know myself also a Malik, I, I don't know if I've mentioned, but people yeah. may know uh, that we hold th these events and there's a lot of people and, and I really enjoy people and I want to meet people mm -hmm. and, and talk to them and so forth. But at the end of the day, I am just exhausted and I need to pull <laughs> back. Whereas my, my wife, uh, Rebecca Bustamante, at the end of the day, she can have 
a dozen people waiting for her, waiting to, to speak with her, and she's energized and she keeps going. So it's just different kinds of people and, and it takes a mix. But please, if you're an introvert, don't feel bad. I think it's an advantage because so many people like Malik, uh, you know, do better to, so I'll just say that, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think w w if if I may add one more, please, thing. yeah, just sur surround yourself with extroverted people also, so they compliment you. You know, but just I... like you have done with Rebecca, I have done that with Tanishi. She is also an extroverted person. Okay. Uh, she, she is a social butterfly. Uh, she has absolutely no issues. Uh, um, you know, being in social setting. In fact, she shines in that environment. Whereas I want to do my part and leave as soon as possible. Um, sure. And in workplace also, I think uh, if you're an introverted leader, make sure that uh, in certain positions, uh, like someone who is in charge of your HR, you know, chief people officer or the chief marketing officer, or the chief sales officer, don't find the people who are same like you, because for those yes. positions, you would need people who are extroverted naturally. That is yes. not a, it's not a, a chore for them to get in front of people. So you have to know your weaknesses and also then make sure that you complement those with other people very good advice okay well malik could i talk a bit about and if, if you're comfortable but your you know your childhood i think it's it's interesting just to i mean how how was your your family structure you mentioned your father hard-working guy your mother seem to be focused on, on achievement your other parts are, of your family were, were they in similar situations or, or what uh so i have two sisters elder sister i was the youngest um okay my eldest sister also did well in school uh my uh, second sister uh, she now lives in new york city works at a hospital uh, and has done a great job not only in her professional career but raising three extremely talented uh, nieces that i have so um, it seems like um, there is a drive uh, in general across all the family members and just whatever they're doing, they want to do the best. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's, that was something that we saw our parents doing and it was natural for us to continue doing. And that's one thing that I'm trying to do that with my daughters as well. And I know we'll probably talk a little bit about that later uh, is to very early on, keep them busy with activities and let them then choose which activity resonates with them the most. And then encouraging them to not be better than anybody else, but be the best they can be, you know, their personal best, not better than this person or that person, because that can, can get onto your nerves and, you know, you can go through depression. Um, but uh, if you're just trying to race with yourself and not with anybody else, then life is a, a breeze because you're just, looking at what you did yesterday and how can I do better? Okay. Okay. Malik, you know, you talked a, a different times a, a bit about your, you know, the, the, call it the strengths you have, you, you know, the things that you really feel have been advantages about you that have really helped you. C can you round out them again? What, what do you think are some of your, your most important strengths that have helped you a lot in, in your career in life? Well, I think uh, we covered some of those things uh, early on, uh, Richard. You yeah. know, the ability ability to uh, keep learning. You know, yes. never stop learning. That's one thing uh, that I have emulated from other uh, leaders. Uh, the ability to stick your neck out and try new things and not be afraid of failure. Um, I think that's something that comes very naturally to me, just because okay. I've been trying things and then it didn't work out. Try different things. Uh, it's not that natural for human beings because we are afraid of failures. We have been told to fail is to lose and nobody wants to be a loser. Whereas um, in the new day and age, uh, unless you fail and learn very quickly from it, you would never get better, right? That's the yeah. world that we are going towards. So that's something else that um, I have tried to emulate from other people. Uh, something else uh, that I have work really hard on myself is uh, how to inspire other people. Um, and I, I, I share with people that when you meet with people as a leader, uh, don't look at them as they are, but look at them as they can be. 
so if you naturally cultivate that habit of anytime you meet one of your team members, don't view them as they are today, meaning what they are able to do with their current set of talents. But imagine, given the background they come from, given the foundation they have already built, what they can be five, 10 years down the road. Once you can show the person that, hey, I mean, you are here today, but your potential is to actually be here and you need to start moving in that direction. That's one way to inspire people. Uh, most, of the, most of us don't even know who we are, the amazing set of talents that we have in us. So if we can become the mirror to the people around us and what they can see through that mirror is not who they are today, but what they can be, then that's a great way to start inspiring people to achieve amazing things. And as they achieve amazing things as a leader, you achieve amazing things too, because at the end of the day, you are the summation of everybody's effort going towards the common goal. Okay, superb. Okay, weaknesses. What do you, th everybody has weaknesses. What do you consider your weaknesses, things that you've either overcame or, or had to hide? What, what do you think about that? You know, uh, you ask this question to my mom or to Taninchi, I think they would probably <laughs> give you, they, they will give you a list of things uh, and will ask you probably, how much time do you have, Richard, to hear all that? Okay. Um, but, I, but I think, uh, you know, something that we alluded earlier, I, I felt initially in my life that uh, being introverted was actually a weakness because uh, when you're introverted, it, it, takes a, it takes a lot of effort to go out and sell yourself. Uh, even yeah. now, I mean, you know, I never imagined that I would actually publish a book uh, and I wrote the book because I was enjoying the writing process. But now that I have to go out and actually, you know, put myself out there selling the book or marketing the book, I'm so out of my comfort zone. I mean, uh, being on social media, Richard, when was the last time you saw me on Facebook? When was the last time you heard Malik is on Instagram? When was the last time you saw me ever posting anything on LinkedIn? And yet, in the last two months, I have, you know, tried to overcome that weakness because I, I thought that it being introverted and not trying, not being on social media was ending up being my weakness because I felt like I was sitting in a comfort zone and I needed to kind of get out of that. So that's one thing that um, I'm trying to work on as every day. How do I find the balance of being introverted and yet get my message out to people? Because at the end of the day, uh, we must sing our song. And if you're singing the song by yourself and nobody's listening to that, that doesn't matter either. So you want to sing the song and let the song go out to as many people as possible. Uh, I think something else people will tell you is that um, I have zero tolerance for uh, nonsense at the workplace. So, you know, that's, that's a weakness because we live in a world where there are all kinds of people and you have to put up with all kinds of craziness. Uh, not everybody is going to be as straight shooter as you are. And um, you have to cultivate enough muscles in you to be able to deal with that comes, you know, what you see, for example, what you hear about what's happening in the U S politics, for example. Or, sure. or what you hear about politics in India or Philippines. You have to cultivate enough muscles to be able to deal with some level of nonsense. If you have no patience for it, it's very easy to make enemies and um, you know piss people off uh, as you go along with your life. And I would try to learn to kind of round out my sharp edges as I've grown and uh, learn to work with people of all background, of, people of all beliefs uh, and it's a, it's a work in progress. Just it two is. of the many that I can talk about. <laughs> sure. No, those are good ones. Those are very good ones. Okay. And health choices. Now I, I understand, I remember you used to be a, a bigger uh, guy years ago, but you've really uh, focused on, on your health. And, and I believe that is, it is a very important thing for all of us. What do you do with you? What, what do you consider most important to make your, keep yourself healthy? Well, you know, um, when you are 50 years old and uh, your eldest daughter is four years old and your youngest is one year old, um, it's not just a matter of uh, trying to be healthy to look good anymore. 
there is also another inspiration at work here, Richard, and that is uh, when my daughters will be in their 20s, I'll be in my 70s. And I don't want to look like I'm in my 70s when they're in their 20s. Uh, and so it's an it's a intentional effort to be as healthy as possible, not just for myself, but also so that I'm very actively involved in their life. Um, and I'm able to do everything that any parent typically would do for their kids. So that's one thing that's driving me to be, you know, as healthy as possible. In fact, from the day last time we met, I think it was six or seven months ago, um, I have lost some 18 pounds uh, because I have wow. done, I have focused more on my yoga practice. Um, I have given up sugar. Uh, okay. So I'm trying uh, different uh, al alternatives to sugar, and it's working out really well. I have also tried to incorporate intermittent fasting, uh, where I went from, you know, having two meals between noon and six to now having one big meal now and a very small snack around 3 p.m. and then not work, not eating for 21 hours every day. And honestly, combined, these three things have been amazing in my life. I mean, I have felt the biggest difference in my health since I have intensified my yoga practice. I have uh, given up sugar and uh, have really religiously followed this uh, intermittent fasting. That's fascinating. Now, I also do this intermittent fasting as well maybe not quite as intense as you, but can you describe this? No, so you have one big meal at lunch, you mean, or, or when? Yeah, okay. so um, I eat one big meal around uh, noon every day. Uh, and then um, I just have a very small snack of like nuts or something super healthy around 3 p.m. And then nothing after that, just drinking water for the rest of the day. And honestly, in the beginning, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be so hungry and uh, I'm going to only think about food for the rest of the day. But I have so much more energy and my there is enough clarity in my mind about uh, what I want to do. And I don't feel that hungry even in the evening. I have, in fact, more energy to do so many more things. So sometimes we overestimate the importance of food. Uh, in our life. We think that we need more protein and we need more carbs and we need more fat. That's not the case, actually. Our body can survive uh, with one meal. As long as it's a really healthy, balanced meal that you take, then, you know, you can go about your life uh, for the remaining 21, 22 hours a day. Fantastic. Yes, yeah. I, if I can just, my own experience, but I was, yeah. when I hit age 50, I'm 57 now, so I'm a little bit older than you, mm. but I started to gain weight. I've never had a problem with weight in my entire life. Yeah. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll cut back on food. And so forth. Nothing worked until I started doing this intermittent fasting. So I do two meals a day mm. and I've really cut back to, you know, fruits and vegetables. I do eat meat, but not much. Mm. Mm -hmm. I would like to be, you know, like you, a, a, a full oh. a vegetarian, I, I think. Well, but I'd like to try it, but, but I'm, I'm mm -hmm. close, but not, uh, but, you know, I, I, but I feel much uh, healthier. On the sugar side, when you mention you don't take sugar anymore, how did you take it before? You mean you used to add sugar to your coffee or cereal? What, yeah. What I, I, I used to, um, I have a sweet tooth. And so okay. this was a very hard thing for, for me to give up. Uh, right. uh, and so I don't put regular sugar or coconut sugar or honey, any sugar derivative into coffee or tea. Uh, I try to avoid eating sugar uh, made desserts. Uh, once in a while when we go out, I splurge and, you know, have a nice uh, piece of cheesecake or chocolate cake or tiramisu. And then we really go crazy at that time. But on a day-to-day -day basis, um, not adding sugar, instead using stevia, which is the most natural okay. alternative with the least amount of side effects uh, that I can find, uh, that I can find during my research that I'm taking. So, and, and it really works. Um, I don't see the difference. Um, and because I'm feeling the 
a healthy aura around me because of giving up sugar, I'm incentivized to actually keep trying stevia. Whereas some people feel that they still miss sugar if they are trying the alternatives. That's interesting. Okay, well done. That's a very good Thank story. You. Hopefully, it'll motivate others because uh, this intermittent fasting and just healthy eating really does make a yes. big impact if you're serious about a career in business, especially or any career yeah. of success. Um, Malik, you started late as you know you're as a husband and father. Was this a big adjust? Because maybe if you could tell people about this, I mean, well, first of all, how old were you when you first became married for the first time, Malik? Well, I mean, obviously, as you know, um, Tanishi and I, um, we have been uh, going out for many years. I met oh, her were. during, uh, yes, I met her during my Teletech days. Okay. And then uh, after I left uh, Teletech, I thought there was more to that friendship than. Uh, just, uh, you know, having a really close friend around. Uh, so we took it to the next level. And, you know, to your point, uh, because I was so used to the bachelor life, I thought, uh, you know, nothing was missing. She was part of my life. Uh, we were traveling around the world when we got a chance. Um, we used to spend a lot of time together when we had time here in Manila as well. Uh, but then we got to the point where, you know, where is this going? Um, what is the natural progression? And it's mainly because of me that I avoided taking the next step. You know how we are as men. Um, commitment is something that doesn't come very naturally to us. <laughs> and the longer you wait, uh, it becomes harder and harder uh, for you. And so um, we got to the point where we said, okay, you know, I'm not getting any younger. She was not getting any younger. And I thought, okay, now is a good time to, you know, make the commitment and go with it. And honestly, uh, I could not have imagined a better thing. Um, I, I wish I would have made that choice earlier. Uh, and I, I wish I would have uh, tied the knot earlier and had kids earlier. Uh, but, you know, maybe life has to proceed as, um, as I had to you know, to learn my lessons and uh, to know for a fact that this is the best thing for me uh, in my career and in my life as well. Sure. And yeah. now, Malik, how did you, because so, so you met through, through work and there was a, a mutual bond, I, I guess, and, and you just kind of, kind of started sneaking around dating initially, or, or was it a full blown relationship right from the beginning? How, how did that work out? Well, I mean, uh, obviously, it's not. Uh, thanks for asking all these very tough questions. By the way. <laughs> I, I see a big smile on your face, so I had to call you out for that. Well, it's it's interesting, you know, for helping yeah. other people too. Well, I mean, it was uh, it was definitely something that took me uh, like it was like it took me by the horns and said, "Malik, I mean, you cannot." not miss this uh, and um, yeah, you know obviously when i was talking to her our communication was right on this dot um, we share the same frequency um, we complement each other our food habits are the same and it never felt like okay i wish this conversation ends now and i can go back to my corner and start do doing something when i was with her right from the beginning I felt like the time was coming to stand still. Uh, it felt like uh, it didn't really matter what else was going around me. I was super happy to just be in her presence and in her company. So as you start feeling that, uh, you want to you know, hang out more and more with that person. Then we took some trips together uh, around the world and she became the best traveling partner I can imagine, you know, because we love the same kind of food we like, we had the same rhythm. We didn't feel like, you know, if we go to some places, we had to fill up that entire schedule with touristic activities. Uh, there were days when we wanted to go out and do things. And there were days when we wanted to just chill out in the hotel and have good food. And so there was never any friction about what needs to happen when we're traveling. And if you can travel with somebody, you know, stress-free, if you can travel with somebody and enjoy, 
that's a good indication that that's a good partner for life. Uh, because uh, when you're traveling, it's kind of a microcosm of life. You know, you're in a small hotel room together, you are spending 24 hours together. And if you can get along and if you have fun during that time, then obviously that's a good indication that that person is meant for you. Uh, so uh, slowly but surely, it, it kind of evolved very slowly and uh, then became very full, full blown. And then I was the one who was just uh, wondering, okay, now what, what do I do with this, right? Uh, what is this situation? So it was you, it was because I got the ultimatum that you either marry me or else. And so I said, <laughs> Okay, I guess we're gonna. But but with you, it was you more more driving the driving the car, so to speak. Well, I mean, uh, she. Uh, or did she give obviously it to enjoyed, uh, and she was getting to the point where it was like, well, like you know, where is this going as well? So ultimately, I think we both came to the same question: Where do we go from this beautiful thing that we have built together? And uh, it made sense to take it to the next level. Uh, and, and everybody we would meet with, they would say, Malik, you guys need to have kids together because they would be so beautiful. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, uh, we are practicing and we are trying our best, uh, but maybe we need, to, <laughs> we need to probably take it to the next level and really you know, be serious about it. Well, I'm sure your poor Indian mother waited so long for you to get married. I'm sure she's very pleased with Tonichi, who I've met, and, and she's yeah. just a wonderful uh, and, and very attractive uh, person in every way. Uh, so that's a, a very good thing. Now, on, um, but now marriage changes things, though. Did anything change about your relationship or, or was a, a continuation? That's a, kind of the first thing. And what did you learn from this? What, what changed in your life, you know, from being a bachelor for so many years to being married? I think been positive change, uh, and okay. I'm not saying it just because she's in the room. She's here, there, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so we be, we better be careful because I'm sure Rebecca yeah. is right next to you as well. Sure. But uh, true. I, I, you know, one positive thing that came out of it was uh, until I did not make that decision and commitment, I was spending part of my brain cells towards whether I'm going to get married or is it in my cards you know so those questions were using up some of my brain energy and once i made the commitment that okay this is what i want to do and uh, this is the life i want to choose it has freed up those brain cells to do other things now and so i, I feel that that's a positive thing for me i'm not in that loop whether i want to do that thing or not i have done it now so i'm committed to it and now that has freed up all the brain cells to do other creative things in my life. And uh, I think that's one positive change that uh, it has brought about. The other thing is uh, you become more patient and you also become more understanding of not only the other person, but also that they are also evolving, right? I think the reason why the marriages are so difficult uh, and you and I exchanged some emails about that, uh, Richard, before this, is that not only men and women are so different, but they are also evolving as, as the time goes. So the person you met 10 years ago may not be the same person today and would not be the same person 10 years from now. And so it's important for you to appreciate that evolution that happens in everybody and not resent the fact that they are changing and you are not. Instead, it forces you to also look at your own evolution and uh, it also forces you to look at your own life and say, where are you going with your life? You know, where do you want to go? What is your point B when the other person is going towards that point B as well? So as long as both people are growing at the same time uh, and yet looking at some of the fundamentals of life the same way, then you're in a good shape. Okay. And now I asked a question that uh, you found uh, funny, but uh, I, and it is, but, but, you know, understanding women, do you feel that you now understand women or you still got a long way to go? What do you, what, what do you say about that? You know, uh, as I mentioned to you in the email, I think uh, this is such an 
important question. Uh, it's almost as, as deep as uh, why am I here, right? What is the sure. purpose of life? That we should probably have a completely new podcast for it. Uh, you know, once I have done enough research about it, but whether I understand all women, I don't know. Uh, but I, I feel that uh, I know Tanishi really well. Um, I, I feel that I understand her well, uh, and that's important to me. Um, as long as that understanding remains, uh, I'm not here. That's not my life goal to understand all women in the world. I may not ever be able to do that. Um, but I just want to make sure that I continue to understand Tanishi and uh, I continue to have that strong bond with her. Okay. And so with communication, now you seem, you communicate in a very direct manner. And sometimes, you know, women say, for instance, I, I spoke with someone last, last week, very successful. She runs a very large uh, logistics business that was, uh, invest uh, SM uh, bought a big um, part of their company and a very successful career. And she was describing, you know, her husband is often clueless. And, and most men are, she said, clueless when it comes to women. And, and so, and I, I agree, we are. And, but how I kind of got her back a bit was I said, well, yeah, when a woman, you know, because oftentimes, you got to be a bit of a detective and read the, the layers of understanding when women say something. So what I told my sons is when a woman says it's fine, do whatever you want, then it's not fine and don't do whatever you want. And they liked it. It's kind of funny. And, and, uh, but do you have any communication things like, like that? Or, you know, uh, or is it all smooth sailing? Like, what do, what do you No, uh, well, uh, I agree. Us. I think uh, I want to avoid an instance where she says with that face that, okay, do whatever you want to do. Uh, because that's, that's a big red flag right there that, okay. no, she's not fine with it and you better not do it. Um, and, or if she says, okay, if that's what you want, do it. Uh, that's another red flag. I don't think um, once she says that, you should not take it at the face value. You should do a U-turn and do the opposite because uh, she's clearly not happy with your cho her choice. So uh, the good news is I think uh, our communication styles actually complement each other. Uh, you are right, I'm very direct. Uh, I don't talk a lot about what I want or you know, I'm you usually in my own little corner doing my own thing. Um, but she knows that when I say something, I really mean it because I hardly say something uh, on right. what needs to happen. So okay. everybody pays attention to when I do say something. Whereas in her case, she obviously, you know, has her own way of communicating with me. And uh, we both have our love language and uh, we keep investing in that love language. I think that's important. Whatever love language you have with your partner, keep, keep investing in it because sometimes it's not the words. Sometimes your love language is the action that you take. Uh, sometimes it's your thoughtfulness. Uh, sometimes uh, it's your ability to predict how she would feel about something and avoiding it. If she keeps seeing that, you are investing in understanding her and you're investing in making sure that you avoid all the red flags then uh, you're in a good shape. Okay. Okay, good advice. And <laughs> as a father, mm -hmm. now, I, I thought you only had one daughter, do, do you? Or, or do you have two now? Two, yes. Two? Yeah. God, you've been busy. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be proud of you. What? Yes. So, and, and they're two daughters. So you are living in a sea of estrogen, uh, I might say. Yes. Uh, and especially as, uh, as the girls get older. So what have you learned as a father? You know, that, that's a big step in, in any person's life. Well, what, do you, what do you think about that? No, it's been such a blessing. Um, and I actually, in my book, I write that um, right in the introduction, I said uh, one of the inspiration for writing this book actually came from um, my first daughter. And we talked about it, uh, Richard, when we had dinner with you and Rebecca, that it really prompted uh, some questions in my mind as to 
if she's, you know, turning four today, actually, uh, in 20 years, what kind of world she will be inheriting? What kind of uh, future she'll be inheriting from us? What talents and skills that she would need uh, over the next 20 years to succeed? Uh, so those are some of the things that I started thinking. Um, so before, I would only think about the future when I'm writing my three-year or a five-year strategy plan that I need to present to the board. Now, I'm thinking about future because it has become more meaningful. Uh, for me, future is now about what will Clara inherit and what would Savannah, our second daughter, would inherit 20 years from now. Uh, and I'm also inspired by the, the curiosity that I see in her eyes. Uh, she wakes up in the morning and uh, for her, everything is a miracle. Uh, when she looks at a flower, she's blown away by the beauty of the flower. When we take a walk around our neighborhood, she picks up every single flower that she looks at it and really invest her time in looking at every nuance of that flower in terms of the colors and uh, how it beautifully blooms. Uh, things that as an adult, I have stopped doing. And so she's teaching me to look at life as a miracle, that everything around us is a miracle uh, because we have a choice. Either everything around us is a miracle as Einstein said, or it's not. Uh, we have two ways of living a life. And because of Clara and because of Savannah, um, life has suddenly become a miraculous uh, experiment. Uh, and I'm trying to imbibe and you know, emulate the same kind of sense of wonder about life that I see in my daughters. Very good. And you seem like a very active father. Is, is this a fair uh, thing? Yeah, you think this is very important? Very How about, important. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And are, are you teaching them skills? You know, you want them to do scuba diving? You want them to pilots? What, what do you, all this stuff? Or, or are you going to hold back on that stuff? What, what do you think? No, and, and I remember having a great conversation with you about this, Richard, uh, during our dinner as well. <laughs> and and my, my philosophy is very simple. I, I don't want to, if, you know, people are asking me, what do you want Clara to be when she grows up? What do you want Savannah to be when she grows up? And really, I don't have any preconceived notions. Like my parents wanted me to become an engineer or a doctor when I was growing up because hmm. they wanted the best for me. And they knew that if I became an engineer or a doctor, Financially, I'll be in a better place. So I know exactly where they came from. But now we are in a different world. I mean, 50% of the things Clara and Savannah will be doing 20 years from now are not even invented yet. Imagine 20 years ago, if you asked a kid, I want you to become an app developer. There was no app developing at that time. And now so many young kids are into developing apps or becoming a video gamer sensation on YouTube. Uh, nobody would have thought about that as an option True. as well 20 years True. from now. So what Clara and Savannah can do 20 years from now is not even 50% of that is not even available to us. We don't even know what that would be. So my approach is uh, expose them to as many skills and talents as they can while they're young and on their own, they would gravitate towards certain things. So, you know, we have Clara, she's an um, accomplished swimmer already. She's four, uh, but she knows how to do freestyle. She knows how to do breaststroke. Um, she'll give me run for the money when I'm swimming. Yes. She's that fast, unbelievable. Um, she's learning piano. She's learning, um, uh, you know, uh, ballet. Uh, we have a soccer game for her every weekend that she goes to. So the goal is to keep her busy with so many different things. And then We'll find out in next five, 10 years, whether she likes soccer or not, whether she likes playing piano or not. And it will allow her to then plan her life accordingly, whether she wants to pursue artistic things, she wants to pursue analytical things, it's up to her. But our goal is to expose them to as many things as possible at this age, and then let them kind of live their life. Fantastic, yes. Okay, very good. and. Now for yourself, so what's the next phase in Malik's uh, life or career? I mean, okay, your life is your, your children, your, your family, but let's say your professional thing. I, you, you've just released a book. Mm -hmm. I know you're a 
you know, uh, for people, anybody out there who's looking for a good uh, a professional speaker, motivational or, or uh, technical issues, leadership issues, I mean, I think you'd certainly be uh, a good option for them. But what are you working on? What, what, what's the next phase for you, Malik? Sure. So, you know, luckily I'm in a place where, you know, I, I can choose where I want to spend my time in. And uh, my philosophy now is I only want to do things that I'm really super happy about doing that I feel passionate about. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have enjoyed writing. I, I used to write uh, inspirational emails to people. I never thought I would actually end up writing a 50,000 word book. Um, but given the fact that I was stuck in quarantines everywhere I went during my travels, <laughs> I had a lot of time to, you know, finish some of the thoughts and, and you know, put together a book that's now out. Um, I enjoy, as you mentioned, uh, getting in front of people and sharing my thoughts on how to lead people, where the world is going, and how to be uh, prepared for uh, the next decade, which will be very disruptive over the, um, as, uh, you know, the artificial intelligence as um, some of the other disruptive forces peak over the next 10 years. Uh, something else that I'm very passionate about is uh, investing in companies that would bridge the gap between where we are now to where we are going. So I have made uh, some investments in, uh, as an angel investor, as well as as an entrepreneur in some really interesting uh, assets uh, based in India, as well as Singapore. Um, and uh, I'm quite passionate about where they are going. It's still very early stages, uh, so we can't really share a lot of details about it, but um, they all involve using the latest uh, technologies like artificial intelligence, deep learning uh, in helping us human beings with our health issues, with uh, how we go about uh, uh, creating a platform for jewelers in India, for example. So. I'm quite fascinated about how the technology will bridge the gap between where we are now and where the world is going and quite excited about uh, the next 10 years. Okay. What else can you tell us about your views of the next 10 years? You got really uh, intrigued me here. Mm. Um, artificial intelligence, how will our life change you think in 10 years? So um, the reason I, I thought that book was quite timely, uh, Richard, is because uh, Right now, we are all very busy with COVID-19, uh, but COVID-19, as the vaccines get distributed and we start getting our turn to get the vaccines around the world, and it may take you know, a few more months, but we'll start fading away in our lives. And we'll be thinking about COVID-19 just the way we think about 9-11. Uh, we yeah. think of 9-11 on its anniversary. Yes, it was a huge impact when it happened, but now it's a history. It's part of our past. And it changed the way we travel, you know, through increased security. But otherwise, life is back to normal. And the same thing will happen with COVID-19 as well. Our life would go back to normal. But then the other disruptive forces will be gaining momentum over the next 10 years. So artificial intelligence, the digital natives, and uh, the gig economy. You know, artificial intelligence, why? Because over the next 10 years, according to McKinsey, up to 375 million jobs are at risk. Uh, of displacement around the world. Uh, so we need to be prepared for what that means for these 375 million people. We'll also have to think about what it means to people whose jobs may, be, may not be displaced, but will be changed dramatically over the years, right? Something else uh, that is fascinating is digital natives. In yes. 10 years, two thirds of our global workforce will be made up of uh, the millennials and the Gen Zers. So we are always looking at these people as the interns or the entry level employees, but in 10 years, they'll be sitting in a position of influence and power and they are a different breed altogether. So we must understand them and we must learn about what motivates them as leaders and as workers. And the third thing is the gig economy. I think it's one of the most powerful forces because uh, workplace is the last frontier for freedom. You know, in our lives, we have freedom. Uh, weekends, we have freedom. But mon come Monday, when we go back to work, uh, we lose that freedom because someone else is <laughs> thinking about what we should be doing, who should be doing it with, uh, when we should be doing it, where we should be doing it. We lose a lot of control of our life when we go to work. And now because of the, the freelancing economy and how popular it's becoming, 
people have a choice to strike out on their own and become a business person, so to speak, and start doing work with people that they want to work with. Uh, as a freelancer, you can decide whether you want to work at 2 a.m. in the morning or 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, you can decide whether you're wearing pajamas while you're working or you're wearing a business suit. So freelancing gives people a lot of freedom. And according to one of the studies that I um, looked at during my research is that uh, some over 50% of the U.S. workforce will be involved in freelancing economy by 2030. And that's a huge number. Today, that number is around 35%. So suddenly that is going to change the way work gets done. We are used to working through our existing employees coming to work every day in our office spaces. Because of freelancing, that model is going to completely change over the next 10 years. Absolutely. And do you feel uh, COVID has moved that ahead faster? Like if, if I can uh, tell you, we, you know that we hold these regular events in different industries and it's a topic in almost every one of them about the future of work, the change of the work. Young people, like you mentioned, they no longer want to. They don't want to go back to work and sit in, in a cubicle. They want to work from home. Yeah. They want to shop at home. They want to be entertained at home. They want to eat out, you know, delivered at mm -hmm. home. So it's it's really, but do you think COVID ha has really moved this ahead or, or this was going that direction anyway? What, what do you think? No, it was going in that direction anyway, but I think COVID-19 was the jolt that we all needed. Yeah. So even the companies who were far behind in their digital transformation had no choice but to get on that train and yes. very quickly adapt to this new way of life. But my concern is that, uh, you know, two years from now, companies would gravitate towards that control thing and that they would feel that employees coming to work and full-time employees are the best way to go about it. Whereas freelancing economy will continue to take off, right? So there is going to be a little bit of a tug of war between companies wanting to go back to the way life was and employees wanting to have more freedom and the companies who will adapt to this new way of doing things and continue to build on it, what they have done during the COVID-19 situation will continue to benefit from it because the world is going towards more freedom. Freedom is actually, if you look at it now, Richard, is the biggest currency for people. Uh, it's no longer money. I mean, there are young people who are saying for more freedom, they're willing to take a pay cut. Uh, people have different um, approaches to life. What is, people look at things differently than how other generations have looked at in the past. And I think we need to slowly start adjust to that. Yeah. Well, another thing, if I could ask you, Malik, related to that, I mean, right, right now as it is in this, uh, your beloved business process outsourcing industry. Now, most large companies now do various types of work processes in overseas locations very successfully, like in India and Philippines and other countries. But mid-sized companies and small com companies, especially, I understand are not, uh, well, don't have near the penetration. Um, but there's many companies that employ people right now who are working from home. People, let's say you've got an, an accountant who's been with you for 10 years and he's, you know, well paid, but maybe he's not uh, performing uh, where he was. It'd be very easy to, since the person already works from home during COVID, to move that job to India or Philippines for far less. And this could be a real, uh, so, so freedom, yes, this will be a tremendously, you know, for, for mothers with children, for people in rural areas in countries like Philippines, India, they can really fully participate in the global economy. It might be an upset though, for people who are gonna lose their jobs, <laughs> but I think, this is the, the normal process. Do you see something like that happening or, or do you think I'm, I'm uh, over the top? No, no, I think uh, that is uh, a potential challenge that people have to be prepared for. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why in my book, I write about five things you can do to future-proof your career. Uh, okay. What are the five 
things you can do? What are five things you can invest in to make sure that you remain relevant in uh, the future that we are going towards? Uh, something else that will change in countries like the US and Canada is if uh, work from home model becomes more prevalent, uh, even after COVID-19, and if freelancing takes off the way, you know, some of the studies are predicting it to be, then you will see a change uh, in how the demographics are working, you know, so people would start leaving the cities and uh, would uh, yes. go to the rural markets. Um, and so you will see that transition taking place in the countries as well, because you no longer are bound by where you need to live, that you need to live close to the office anymore because you could easily work from home. So these forces yes. are so disruptive uh, and Fantastic. they wouldn't just impact the people's careers and the companies, but they have the potential to impact the societies in general. I mean, just to give an example of the Philippines, what is the biggest part of Philippine economy? The OFW remittances. Uh, oh, yes. Millions of Filipinos have to leave the country today to make a good living and then send money back to their uh, siblings, their families. Freelancing allows you now to have a good global job uh, that pays you well by living in your country, by being with your family uh, and being very competitive with people from India or from US, as long as you are good at what you're doing. So suddenly, there needs to be a department. I mean, one of the one of the webinars that I did, I, I suggested that government actually should look into creating a department, just like they have created a department for OFW, uh, creating a department for people who will be embracing this freelancing lifestyle, because that could easily become a second big source of revenue, just like BPO has done. Right, the BPO yes, industry yes, is very yes. close to the remittances. Yes. The freelancers collectively together can be the next phase of growth for this country and countries like India and Kenya and Nigeria, for example. Yes. Just to give an example, Richard, the reason I'm such a big believer in this freelancing is because my entire book was put together by freelancers. I self-published the book someone sitting in the us did the copy editing someone sitting in um, italy did the proofreading someone in indonesia did the book cover for me somebody in nigeria did my book trailer video that i published uh, on uh, the day of the book launch so how did this come Fantastic. about it is so yeah. easy uh, you go to upwork or freelancer and you can meet incredibly talented people from around the world and guess what they are not having to stand outside of a consulate of US for a visa anymore and leave their families behind, leave their culture behind to go to a land of opportunity. They're embracing the land of opportunity from where they are. That is amazing. And it's only gonna grow over the next 10 years. It is, oh, I'm so glad to hear you say this. This is really, uh, I, I agree, I, I haven't heard uh, as much depth as what you just said, but yes, it's so exciting what's going to happen and what is happening. Yeah. So that's really, really very good. It's going to be really exciting to watch the next 10 years. Now for you, last question mm -hmm. for you, then the next 10 years or five, let's say, where do you want to be in your life? What, what's your, what, what's your plans? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to keep singing my song. I'm, I have the luxury, uh, Richard, where uh, I'm at a point where I, I can decide what I want to do and where I want to spend my time in. So my simple uh, solution to that is I only want to do things that really make me happy. Uh, I want to only sing my own songs. Um, you know, so for me, singing my song is writing. Singing my song is getting in front of people and sharing my thoughts about uh, how to prepare for the next 10 years and beyond. Uh, singing my song means um, going on a safari and taking pictures uh, of wildlife um, and videos of wildlife, uh, doing some drone photography, some drone um, uh, videos. So those are some of the things that I want to invest my time in and obviously spend some very quality time with the family as, and be as involved in um, you know, the upbringing of my girls make sure that they 
grow up to be good citizens of the world and they contribute uh, and they sing their song when they grow up, uh, whatever song that is. Fantastic. Malik, it has been fan, it's just been wonderful speaking with you for the past, I think it's an hour and a half. I thought it was 20 minutes, but <laughs> in any case, really, really nice. I'm so glad to see you're doing well, losing weight and, and uh, you look, you look good. So uh, please keep well, and I look forward to getting back to uh, Asia Pacific and seeing people in, in person, but this is a good, uh, you know, second choice. So again, Malik, really, really nice. I, I think the information you shared will really help people in their careers, their own personal careers and lives. And uh, even your, your vision for the future is very interesting as well. We need to get everybody ready to be able to you know, have the skills to to meet these these job requirements that that are certainly coming. Um, yes. Yeah. No, I appreciate this time, uh, Richard. It's always a pleasure talking to you. These are with you. I know it's never a shallow conversation. It goes <laughs> deep. Um, so I was prepared for it, but, but I didn't realize it would go this deep. But uh, in any case, <laughs> I really enjoyed it and uh, wish you the very best for creating this podcast. I think uh, uh, if there's anybody who has access to all the movers and shakers, not only in the Philippines, but in Asia, it's you. And so I have no doubt you're going to have a series of incredibly talented uh, business uh, and uh, leaders from other parts of the world uh, to come and share their insights. So I'm, I'm super happy and honored and humbled that uh, you included, included me in part of your uh, podcast series. Very wonderful to see, and we'll have to have you back again when we can talk about women in particular, and we can focus on that subject, maybe to help the younger guys, you know, see the light a bit, because it's hard for young guys, you know, to understand women, and it's hard for women, but men do seem so clueless. So, Malik, really, really a pleasure to see you, and uh, even Tanichi, just a, a glance anyway, but um, please keep doing well. And we want to see you do great things continually in the future. All right. Thank you, Richard. Same to you as well. Best wishes to you. And also say hi to Richard, uh, Rebecca for me. I will. Thank you very All much, right. Malik. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care, sir. Okay.